right, Mike. Well, listen, th thanks for taking out the time to do this. I know you've got to be pretty busy if you're getting ready to go to Toronto. Yeah, yeah, so. we're leaving early Thursday, and there's more than I can get done here before I go. Well, I appreciate your time. All right. So I'd like to start this out, Michael, with um, something that I heard from a really good friend of mine, Bruce Lipton. He's a microbiologist and sort of set the tone for this interview. He, he once told me, he says, remember the story about the caterpillar becoming a butterfly? And I said, yeah. He says, well, something that a lot of people don't really recognize is the fact that there's a, that part in the middle because the caterpillar ends up eating hundreds of times its weight in food and almost destroys its environment. But for some unknown reason, it finds some place to hang upside down and spins its cocoon and completely starts breaking down. And in the midst of that chaos, if you would open up that cocoon, it looks like a bunch of, well, let's just call it garbage. It looks like a bunch of chaotic garbage. But inside all of those cells that look really chaotic are something called imaginative cells. And he says that the amazing thing about, about the imaginative cells is they somehow pick up on a visionary experience of what has to be. And they use all of the chaotic cells that look like they're nothing but garbage from the old caterpillar days and reformulate that into a new pattern of a butterfly. And I think in today's world, that's what we call our visionaries. People that are able to use the old worn out garbage of our past, all of our call it mistakes for lack of better words, but they're able to use that and see beyond the chaos, see beyond the conflict, see beyond the, all of the negativity and go, okay, it's time to take a deep breath tune in to what is really necessary and start visualizing a new future and, and use what we have here at our disposal. And, and this reminds me of you. You know, you, you're like a, uh, I don't know, when my wife and I first watched The Garbage Warrior, we were obviously impressed. You know, it's a, it's a very impressive thing you're doing. But when we got, we bought all of your manuals and uh, when, we, when we read your vision, and we, we just thought, you know what? This is really, really important in today's world. No matter if they use your system or straw bale houses or whatever, we have to start living not just sustainable. We have to really bring it down a notch and, and let the, the earth really revitalize itself. <clears throat> so that's really why we wanted to talk to you today because we honestly believe in what you're doing and we have friends in Brazil that really want to hear you when you go to Rio. They, they own thousands of acres outside of Brasilia and we're all totally into what you're trying to do Michael so I really appreciate your time and the, uh, the possibility of helping you spread the word. Okay, thanks. You are one of the imaginative cells. <laughs> I bet I bet of all the things when you were 20 years old if somebody told you someday you're going to be called the garbage warrior and an imaginative cell you'd have probably just laughed at them probably <laughs> <laughs> so where are we at today Michael with with everything that you're doing well it's it's sort of uh I'd have to say it's a crescendo situation. Um, we've started an academy, and it's turning out to be beyond our wildest dreams because when you get young, not not always young, but just uh, eager to to evolve people together in one place, wanting to learn from our past decades of mistakes, but also wanting the same thing, wanting a better world. Uh, the Academy has attracted a bunch of people like that and and that's fueling us, we're fueling them. Uh, we're doing projects all over the world 
plus the academy now the academy is getting integrated into that and it's all just uh, it's it's a lot and we're we're just trying to you know it's almost like having a tiger by the tail we we're trying to keep up with what's going on and it's uh, uh, definitely taking up every ounce of energy and time uh, but it's giving us energy at the same time so it's it's an amazing time for this idea because it is it is needed at this point and we have been doing it for so long we're we're pretty good at it but we're constantly learning like uh, like part of what you were saying made me think of one of the things that we have really learned in the last few years is that part of the whole thing is is in us and having you know we're we're coming up with all kinds of ways to use garbage and and make energy and c harvest water and contain and treat sewage and grow food yeah we're doing all of those things because those systems in the real world here are all flailing right now but another thing that really that I would have to point out to everyone I get a chance to talk to is part of the battle is in our own minds and hearts we have to we have to need less we have to realize that it can be much more simple to stay alive on this planet because there are so many people and there are dwindling resources and there are so many things that are out of control a more simple life is the first step for everyone yeah I, I like what you said once you said live simply so others can simply live and yeah I didn't say that an economist E.F. Shoemaker said that. Yep. Well, it's it's a good one to lay on you because that's exactly what this is about. And yeah. And when you're trying to in when you're trying to make your own power power and harvest your own water and grow your own food and contain and treat your own sewage and heat and cool yourself in your own shelter, when you're trying to do those things, it's a hell of a lot easier to do those things when it's a small amount of power that you need. And, and you know, if, if you're making your own power, all of a sudden you're going to go, well, I don't know that I need to leave these lights on all night long or I don't need that, know that I need to do this. So there, there are a lot of tricks. You know, I don't know that I need to water my lawn all night long if I'm harvesting my own water. You, when you put yourself in charge of, of your uh, uh, utilities, then uh, it does cause you to go you know question what your uses are and you know when you start doing that then you start making room for other people to stay alive on this planet and other and plants and animals you start making room for others yeah my my wife is from Brazil Dara and one of the first things she noticed when she came up here was she said this is crazy everybody has green lawns out in front why doesn't everybody grow food you know? yeah. And being an American and indoctrinated into the climatology of being an American, I never even thought about it. But the more I thought about it, it's actually changed our lives. We have a garden out back. We have uh, a whole solar bank of solar panels. We have two wind turbines. But it, it feeds back into the system and just sort of equalizes our electric bill. But, you know, it's a start. You know, it's a start because we we really think now here's where we have to get a little bit real. I mean, I, I think maybe you have more faith in people than I do. I'm not sure. But the good thing about your system is as an individual, it can be really great. Collectively, it could save lives and mankind. But I'm not too sure if if people will do this until it's too late because people are so comfortable especially in the United States and I think this is something you're going to notice when you go to Brazil people in other countries are more open to this um, one word when you go to Brazil favela we, we had an idea in Brazil when we first watched the garbage warrior to get in touch with with the powers that be in Rio and start a movement 
because you could start at the favela at, at one level and just start working your way down and using all of their bricks and stones and mud and just revitalize that whole area. But th that would be a, a quite a job to tackle. But here in the United States, I don't know. I, I think people are going to stay on this boat until the bow sinks. But it's really good to get the word out for the people that really want to take advantage of this. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that see, the, you can go either way. You can say that the world is not going to make it, but we're just going to make a few, or, or a few people as comfortable as possible uh, on the way down, you know. Uh, you can say that we may make it in time, but the thing is, that's the future. Now is obvious. We need to start uh, making today and tomorrow a little better for uh, for the next day after that. I mean, I'm not really looking too far down the line. I'm looking at what I have to do right now, and what I have to do right now is a lot. And I'm trying to make we we know a, quite a, a bit about how we can make ourselves survive, and we're seeing that it's valuable enough that uh, we want it. We want to share it uh, as much as possible. Uh, you know, when we, I mean, the, the whole process is uh, of like going to Haiti after the earthquake and trying to take what we know and make it work for them um, you know so you'd say that's a nice thing to do and help those people and whatever the truth is we came back we came back we learned more than we taught we learned how simple it could be to live and and how, how the quality of life can be a lot better by living simply and I mean we we came back educated from really trying to educate them. And so you just never know what you're going to get into. And there's no need to predict the future or, or, or be worried about the future. Let's make right now as good as we can. And that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah, because I'm 64 now. And, and I think you've probably learned also that looking back in my life, almost everything I've ever worried about never happened. Yeah, so... Yeah. It, it as you get older, you realize that, and you live more in the moment because we can't really tell what's going to happen in the future. But I know what you mean about other countries. We just got back from Brazil, and there, there's so many people living really, really simply. And again, that's what I like about your system because what most people see as a problem, garbage, you see as a solution. And and I think you can transpose that over onto so many things in our civilization today. Not only in just building a house, but building a future. So much of what we have, we see as a problem, and it's actually a solution if you can find it. Yeah, it's all, it's all a puzzle. And, you know, when, when there is a problem, you maneuver around it until it looks like a solution. I mean, every problem is a solution. And every solution can be a problem. It's like it all has to do with your ability to maneuver, uh, you know, mentally or spiritually or emotionally or, or physically, but just maneuvering your thinking and your belief system. And that's what, that's what made garbage be, you know, gold for us because uh, we started seeing garbage as you know, I see a giant tire pile and I see a, a city. I mean, garbage to me, what, what people call garbage, I don't, even, I don't even have a definition in my mind anymore for garbage I, because I see it as resource. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think the more we go along, too, the, the more we're going to have to realize that. Every once in a while, I go to the dump and, and I just seeing it fill up. And we live in a small community. And I'm seeing that dump fill up. It's, uh, it's amazing that we live in such a world where the, the systems are so centralized. And not only were we dependent on a centralized system, but we're dependent on a monetary system that is also very fragile. 
and right at the verge of being dysfunctional. So I, I think living sustainably and living independent off the grid, or at least the ability to do so, is becoming more important for me, myself, personally. I, I know we have plans to buy a little piece of land down in Brazil and have that as a, a partial retirement place, but also a place to go to in case things ever really do break down. Well, they're in the process of breaking down, but but the thing is, um, it's it's all about you know what do you need now? You need water, you know. You need food. Uh, you need shelter. Uh, you need a certain amount of energy, and uh, it's it's doable. It's doable right now. And the more you learn, I mean, I can't say it enough. The more simply you learn how to live, the easier it is. I mean, a good example is you know, if you hike in the Himalayas. Uh, you only take a, a heavy pack once, and you are so miserable from taking that heavy pack that the next time you only take the bare necessities and very small amounts of that, and then you have a much more enjoyable time. So we have taken a, a heavy pack out into the the world as a as a, a species or whatever, and now we're learning that taking a lighter pack and we have a better life. And there's the, the wealthy people have something to learn from the super poor, and the super poor have something to learn from the wealthy. The main thing is that we all learn from each other. And, you know, one thing we're looking at now is every person, not just the 17% that can, in the developed world, that can afford mortgages and trying to find a housing solution for them. 83% of the people in the world don't even know what a mortgage is. So we're looking for a method of living on this planet that involves a hundred percent of the people on the planet and we're learning that uh, we're learning how to do that by traveling the planet and it's getting pretty you know it's getting pretty amazing uh, what we're finding and what we're putting together and, and and what I'm saying is we're constantly learning yeah I just uh, I mean, this gets into financial enslavement too when you get into mortgages and all of that and and they, again this gets into stress free living but you know I, I was just reading today in Bolivia they gave nature the status of like a human being it has rights and I think that's the beginning of a movement at least in South America to give nature rights I mean I almost feel a little strange even talking about stuff like this because it's, it seems like a no-brainer that the very thing that sustains your life should be protected. But we live in such a an artificial world with all of our meat sanitarily wrapped. We never see the what goes on behind the scenes. Everything's in cans and boxes. And, and I think it's going to get really real for a lot of people when these systems start breaking down yeah it is it's uh and you know you can you can see that that's going to happen and is happening so <clears throat> you know that it's it's looking at uh you know uh, i i said it in a book uh 25 years ago you're, there's clouds on the horizon uh you know take shelter yep yeah i, I like your view from the stars too by the way <laughs> yeah that's a good way to look at it because it sort of releases you from the biasness of not only being a human but being a earth being and see, yeah. seeing this planet from an alien perspective which personally I think might be being done right now actually but be able to see this planet from a an objective point of view it really does look like human beings are, are more like a virus or a bacteria on the planet but we can turn this around if we reevaluate how we live our lives. Yeah, it is. And it's, that's kind of what we're seeing. You know, we started out decades ago trying to make a better way to live the way people are living. And, and we made some headway. But what's important to us now is change the way we're living. And then all the things we have done to make uh, to do that in a different way become very easy. So that's kind of where we're at now is seeing 
that the two thoughts have to come together. The one thought of doing things in a more sustainable way and the other thought of <clears throat> needing less in your whole life program so that what you do do for yourself is much less of a task. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I wrote a book a while back called To Believe or Not to Believe, and it's about <clears throat> all, all of the ways that we believe. It ends up filtering out so much crucial information. And when you start looking at the fact that most of our beliefs are based on Iron Age beliefs and the fact that we have grown up into this system, there's so many people, they, they don't get what we're talking about right now. What, what would you say to that person to wake them up? If you could get them and mentally and emotionally shake them by the collar with your words, what, what would you say? Because our magazine is starting to reach traditional people now, not because our magazine has changed or altered its view, but because traditional systems are breaking down and people are looking for alternative ways to live life and take care of their health and so on and so forth. What would you say to that traditional person to wake them up a little bit? Well, I think uh, the only real wake-up call is when they reach for the milk and it's not there, you know, <laughs> or they reach for the power and it's not there. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't warn them enough, but uh, it's, it's, if you can bring something to them uh, right now that, that impresses them, and, and we, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to travel in the developed world as well as the undeveloped world and, <clears throat> and bring uh, situations about that show people they do not need uh, the the centralized situation in the in the economy. The decentralized approach is really the shot. And I mean, it's not like <clears throat> I don't really try to convince people. I uh, just put it out there and do it and live it. And and then if people see the value in that, they do. And if they don't, they don't. It's not that I really want to stand on a soapbox and preach to people and tell them how they should live and shake them by the collar and change them. I want to quietly demonstrate something, and if it's right, they will follow it. It's like I look at it more like the Pied Piper. You know, I'm playing a tune, and um, the people that feel are moved by that tune, they're going to. They're going to follow that tune. And if it's the right tune, millions will follow. If it's the wrong tune, nobody will follow. And it's up to me to find the, t the tune that is worthy of being followed. And we are trying to find that. And so what I'm saying is I don't want to, I don't want to convince people. I want to have something that is so right on that they don't need convincing. Right. Yeah, I, I think with the information you're talking about, your sincerity, and the fact the internet has been a game changer, you know, that that has changed everything, getting information out to so many people. All of this considered, and I think people are finally starting to recognize that the big changes in life all throughout history have never come from the emperor, the king, or the president, or the people at the top. Every great positive Mo moment in history has always come from one individual at a grassroots level that started a movement where there was a need for that movement. And I think we can see that now with our government. Our government is dysfunctional. A and the, the people at the top, they're not going to initiate change. It's up to people like us at the grassroots level using the power of the internet to really spread the word. Right. You know, it's it's completely up to us. I and I think that that is the biggest thing we have to come to grips with to to bring back our power as individuals and realize I can do this. This is my life and it's passing before me. I can do this a and get off the idea that the government is going to do it for us or some organization or, 
anything. It it is up to us as individuals. I agree. So you you were raised in Kentucky, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I was. I lived in Louisville for a while. Actually, in Lagrange, yeah. uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Born in West Virginia. So we're we're out here in the West now, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, I'm going to let you get back to your life because I know you're busy. Okay. I'm going to uh, really do the best I can with this, transcribe it, and I'll be sending you some magazines once we get it published. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, Michael, you have a great time in Canada, and uh, I think we'll be in touch again because my wife and I, we want to come down there, do a seminar, and get some hands-on at some point. Sounds good. Nice to talk to you. Yep. Same here, Michael. You take care.